These are very, very challenging times. I'm really worried about our communities, our states, our country, our planet. There's too much anger, there's too much fear, there's too much pain, there's too much division and suffering. We ended the 20th century by committing to more police, more prosecutors, more punishment, more prisons, and today, we have the highest rate of incarceration in the world. Our prison population went from about 300,000 in the 1970s to 2.3 million today. There are nearly 5 million people in this country on probation or parole. There are over 70 million Americans with criminal arrest histories, which means that when they try to get jobs or try to get loans, they're disfavored by that history. We've seen this epidemic impact families and communities. The percentage of women sent to jails and prisons has increased 800% in the last 25 years. 80% of the women we put in jails and prisons are single parents with minor children, and another generation is being condemned by our commitment to this unhealthy, punitive space that we have created. My friends at the MLK Community Healthcare Center know that these problems are not about bad behaviors. They are about unhealthy communities. We started saying that people suffering from drug addiction and drug dependency are criminals. We should not have said that. We should have said that people who suffer from addiction and dependency have a health need. And we have to respond to that health need, which is why this is the era that we have to commit to healthier communities. Too many children in our country are born into violent families. They live in violent neighborhoods. They're in violent spaces. They are not embraced. They are not encouraged. They are not hugged. They are challenged and menaced. And these children develop trauma disorders. They go to school uh, with cortisol and adrenaline coursing through their brains, and they need to be made safe. They need to be comforted. But instead, we threaten these children. We say, do this and we'll suspend you. Do that, we'll expel you. That threat and menace feeds the unhealthy circumstances that these children live in. Too many turn to drugs and violence. It is a health disorder, which is why it needs a health response. I believe this is the time to be talking about Dr. King's beloved community, because beloved communities recognize the humanity and dignity in each one of us. I talk about my grandmother a lot because my grandmother was a powerful force in my family. She was the daughter of people who were enslaved. And the experience of being raised by enslaved people gave my grandmother perspective that was unique. Uh, my grandmother was tough, my grandmother was uh, a force, my grandmother was kind, my grandmother was loving. My grandmother was the end of every argument in our family. My grandmother was the start of a lot of arguments in our family. And when integration came to our community, my grandmother wasn't prepared for that. And so she started doing these things she hadn't done before. She started coming up to me and giving me these hugs, and she would squeeze me so tightly, I thought she was trying to hurt me. And then she'd see me an hour later, and she'd say, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And if I said no, my grandmother would jump on me again. And so by the time I was 10, my grandmother had taught me every time I would see her, the first thing I would say is, Mama, I always feel you hugging me. And she'd smile this smile, and I didn't appreciate what she was teaching me until much later. My grandmother worked as a domestic her whole life, now, she lived into her 90s, but when she got into her 90s, she fell. Uh, she broke her hip, and then she was diagnosed with cancer. I was in college when my grandmother was dying, and I went to be with her. And the MLK Community Health Care Center knows how challenging and precious these moments can be. And I remember going to her room, and she was on the bed. Her eyes were closed. Uh, they told me this would be the last conversation, and I just couldn't accept it. And so I picked up her hand and I sat down next to her and I persuaded myself that if I kept talking, she couldn't die. So I just kept talking and talking. And then it dawned on me that I couldn't do this forever and it broke my heart. And I finally found the courage to say my goodbyes and I stood up and I was about to leave and that's when my grandmother opened her eyes. And then she squeezed my hand and she turned to me and the last thing she said to me, she said, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And then she said, I want you to know I'm always going to be hugging you. And there have been times in my life when I have felt the embrace of my grandmother, times when I felt challenged and overwhelmed. And I tell you that story because ultimately, the beloved community is made up of people, people who care, people who understand that when we are working with folks who are sick, who are poor, who are oppressed, who are marginalized, when we work with people 
who have fallen down, sometimes we have to be willing to get close enough to wrap our arms around them and affirm their humanity and their dignity. The beloved community is about affirming the humanity and the dignity of every person. And every day at MLK Community Care, that's what happens. Yes, it's medical care. Yes, it's surgical care. Yes, it's providing urgently needed health services, but it's mostly affirming the humanity and dignity of those who've been marginalized and excluded. And you cannot do that from a distance. You have to get proximate, you have to get close. Healthcare is ultimately about hope. Health represents hope. Dr. Batchelor and the, my friends there understand that hopelessness is the enemy of justice. Injustice prevails where hopelessness persists. Sickness prevails where hopelessness persists. People will die without hope. And so we have to represent those who have this vision of a healthier community, of a healthier neighborhood, of a healthier tomorrow. I'm in Montgomery, Alabama. I stand on the shoulders of people who did so much more with so much less. Every, every day I think about the community that came before me, that generation of black people who would put on their Sunday best. They'd go places uh, to advocate for rights they should have been given decades earlier. But they would put on their Sunday best, they'd go to these places, they'd get down on their knees to pray, and they knew that while they were praying, they'd get battered and bloodied and beaten. And yet, they had enough hope, they had enough courage to go anyway. They stood up when other people said sit down. They spoke when other people said be quiet. It is that spirit that empowers a beloved community and we need it now more than ever. We are haunted by our long history of racial inequality in this country. We are not yet free. We are burdened by the toxins that were created by 400 years of racial hierarchy, racial bigotry. You can see them in the air. They're in LA, they're in New York, they're in Boston, they're in Oakland, they're every place in this country. And we're gonna to have to do some things to challenge this environment. Some have argued that these toxins will eventually dissipate. I don't agree with that. I believe we're gonna to have to commit to caring and treating the conditions that we have inherited. That means we're gonna to have to talk about the fact that we live in a post-genocide society. What happened to indigenous people when Europeans came to this continent was a genocide. We killed millions through famine and war and disease. But we didn't recognize the inequality, the injustice of that. We said instead that those native people, they're different. And that narrative of racial difference gave rise to abuse, to mistreatment, uh, to injustice. And it was that same narrative of racial uh, difference that we used to justify two and a half centuries of slavery. And the great evil of American slavery wasn't the involuntary servitude. It wasn't the forced labor. It was horrific. But the real evil of American slavery was the narrative we created to justify enslavement. We said that black people aren't as good as white people. The enslavers didn't want to feel immoral or unjust or unchristian, so they created these false narratives where they said that black people aren't fully human. Black people are less caring, less worthy, less deserving, and that narrative was something we never confronted. We fought the Civil War. The North won the Civil War, but the South won the narrative war, and for a century, after the Civil War, we allowed lawlessness and terrorism to disrupt black communities. People were pulled out of their homes. They were beaten, drowned, tortured, lynched. Uh, and we never really confronted that fact. The black people in Los Angeles, the black people in Oakland, the black people in New York and Cleveland and Chicago and Detroit largely went to these communities, not as immigrants looking for new economic opportunities, but as refugees and exiles from terror. And they brought with them trauma and abuse, and we haven't treated that trauma and abuse. And yes, we had that heroic civil rights movement, but today we are still living at a time where you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be kind, you can be a pastor, you can be committed to the beloved community, but if you are black or brown, you will go places where you have to navigate this presumption of dangerousness and guilt. And what I can tell you, because I'm getting older, is that when you have to constantly navigate these presumptions of dangerousness and guilt, when you constantly bear the burden of survival, when you encounter the police, when you constantly have to be disfavored because of your color, you get tired and we are tired. And that is why we need this era of truth and justice. That is why we have to commit to a period of time where we care for one another, where we take care of one another. I want us to honor the important work being done at the MLK Community Care Center. I want us to recognize that we are all more than the worst thing we've ever done. 
I want us to understand that the opposite of poverty is not wealth. I believe the opposite of poverty is justice. And finally, I believe that we are going to be judged not by how well we treat the powerful, the privileged, the celebrated, but how we treat the poor, the marginalized, the excluded, the disfavored. My friends and Dr. Batchelor get cut and bruised and scarred by the work they do because it's hard and challenging. But today, I want you to join me in recognizing that they wear medals of honor on behalf of all of us who believe so deeply in the beloved community. Their work and our commitment should advance. Thank you all very, very much.